So today we are talking about how to build a product universe, tactics of product-led branding. So Anna, I'm going to hand over to you because this is one of the topics that, that you've been writing about, you've been thinking about quite a bit. So tell me about you know, what you mean by product universe and where your mind is. So this is how it actually started. It's based mm. on my work at Banana Republic and Esprit. When you start thinking that like, hey, you can, you can build brand through cultural products, which is merchandising, collaborations, events, creative partnerships, content, brand codes, and so on. But what actually really needs to happen is for marketing and merchandising to work really, really close together. And to actually have such a definition of products, product mm -hmm. ranges, collections, hero products, foundations, but then also classics, capsules, limited editions, collaborations, mm -hmm. that that becomes part of a brand's business plan. Mm -hmm. And it becomes part of a brand strategy. And what I mean by that, it literally, you can say, hey, if an entire out product output and most retailers add, 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 add. Solution to more consumption is more products, you know? Mm -hmm. So you end up with SKUs, which, is, which are product numbers that are, are really long tail. And you sometimes don't even know what is going on. And mm -hmm. when merchandisers look at their Excel spreadsheets, they look mostly at the product performance. Did it sell? Mm -hmm. Did it not sell? So this is building upon that, but then also looking at what are our hero products? What is the purest distillation, dist, um, distillation of the brand? Can we use that as a fodder for collaborations? Can we use special materials? Can we have that as something that we do year over year over year, but reissue in a different colors, different materials with different creative partners as part of different capitals? What is our collection? What is that interpretation for seasonal of seasonal trends to our filter? And what are those foundational products that are that go never out of stock? They're always there. And then what is the cultural impact of all of those? How do you build merch around it? How do you build collaborations around it? How do you build content around it? How do you create sort of structure that says, hey, if you're going to use all those different products to start a conversation with, with different members of the creative class, with their key personas, they're going to buy most of this. And all of what I just explained is relevant because it really helps you fine tune your financial plan. It really helps you fine tune how much money do you want to make each month, each quarter, each year, and to go from that objective backwards and say, we need X amount of hero products. We need X amount of collections, X amount of foundations. And this is how our promotional plan looks like. Heroes never go on sale, for example. Foundation hmm. goes on sale after three months. Collections go after one month, never more than 30%. So let's unpack this further, but I first yeah. want to hear your experience. You know, one thing that was from the previous conversation that we had, and because you and I come from slightly different career perspectives and backgrounds, and in the past decade or so, you've spent quite a bit of time in the fashion, luxury, retail world. And... Yeah. My background, part of it is that, but I don't necessarily exclusively focus in that industry just because, you know, we work with multiple clients. So we may have a fashion client, we may have but a sports. But yeah. this is applicable beyond. It's applicable yeah. so, beyond apparel. It's applicable yes. to all sorts. So I'll let you get there. Yeah. So I, I, I want to set the expectation to the audience that actually it can, right. be, it can be applied to CPG as well. Yeah. So like the last time, I want to unpack it from a, a non-sexy, non-fashion perspective Let's a little do bit. It. Yeah. <laughs> so where my mind goes when I, even before this conversation, when I was thinking about it, and I, I want to sort of use this conversation as a way to unpack how some products or some brands that are more utility driven uh -huh. that can have cultural influence. So an obvious sort of utility brand is tech. And something that uh, everybody knows about is, let's say, Google, right? And because a company like Google 
because you talked about Apple and, you know, everybody talks about Apple. I, I, I want to stay away from Apple a little Let's bit. Let's talk about but Google. Let's yeah, talk about yeah. Google. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's, it's got a universe of products that they introduce over time. And they, tr they try to every sizable tech brand mm -hmm. with scale, they try to trap you as much as possible into that universe, right? Mm -hmm. So Google, which started as a search engine company, and then they went into email, they went into cloud computing, like, you know, drive and productivity tools like calendar and doc and so forth, right? So they start with a, maybe this is what you, this is a slightly different perspective because it's not necessarily a hero product, mm -hmm. but they have, they have a, a, a Trojan horse first, yes. right? Yeah. And then from there, they find opportunities to quote unquote invade into people's lives in different ways. So in Google's case, let's say the Trojan horse was search. And then people became used to, oh, you know, let's quote unquote, let's Google it. Mm -hmm. And then found ways or opportunities to expand what was a little tiny speck in people's lives and found other ways to expand in that universe. And then before you, well, maybe not before you know it, but over a course of decade or, or even two decades. Mm -hmm. Now, like I'm so embedded into Google that it's going to be very difficult for me to step away from that universe to go into say like the, the Microsoft universe. Correct. I think that's somewhat different, but I think let's, and let's kind of connect those two things. Yeah. 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 Because for me, what you're talking about is basically how tech companies create network effects and how yes. they create molds, like how they create high switching costs, basically. Mm -hmm. And for you, it's much all those different products are more, more valuable. The more products you use, each individual product is more valuable. Google Calendar, Google Gmail, then Search, then I don't know what else is there, AI now. And Docs, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the more data you share about yourself, the more tailored to you it is, you know, so you yeah, kind yeah. of switch was really high because not only all your friends are there, but also like you spend so much time and effort on, on sharing that information. So it's kind of more useful for you as you interact with it. So that's mm -hmm. number one. But if you start looking at the product pyramid, I think it still can be applied because I can tell you there's some maybe AI is their hero product because people mm -hmm. who use it are maybe not every day and it's price differently or maybe there are cloud services and there's certain services these are the products they make money maybe those are b2b services then their foundational products are what trojan horse that you and something like that which, which they can be like oh their collection they're always adding something because they need mm -hmm. to compete with everyone else so this is a very blunt instrument but i'm just trying to show you how but then what is i think what combines our perspectives is where the cultural products come in yeah. which is how does a google surround each of their tech products with merch collaborations events how do they go how do they attract new people to gmail not just to product-led marketing which is like you know at the beginning it was like all oh, sent from iPhone or, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. like, or add five friends referrals, like that's product led marketing, literally, which was like, how do you get growth through those? But it's more about how do you actually participate in culture as Google? What yeah. is your cultural problem? How does like Gmail or AI or Drive or any of that does merch, for example, limited mm -hmm. edition, like, what does that mean? And I'm not talking about those like stupid merch, those like balls that you can like squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of yeah. like, oh, go with Palace or I don't know, Supreme or, you know, Heist Nobiety and, and have, have a line of how yeah. would Google look if it was a t-shirt or a pair of sneakers? I, I think when it comes to like more functional brands mm. or functional utility companies like Google, Mm -hmm. Right. I think the way they become part of culture is through behavior. 
So for and instance, behavior or oh no no user behavior user user behavior, behavior okay user behavior yeah so by and then it it can only happen to certain limited number of brands to have that cultural club because I think in order for a user behavior to become culture,、mm-hmm. I think you need scale. I think. Absolutely.、So, I think that even、yeah. now, I know I like where you're going with that, but I、yeah. think you don't even need such scale. You just need fans. You need a niche of those. Like almost, you almost need a lot of subcultures, which is way、yeah. more realistic. Because look at the true, there true, is true. no one mega trend. There are a gazillion trends happening at the same time, right, and right, one right. of them explodes, but you could not, and then it dies down very quickly. So I think the same sort of social dynamic happens. Yeah, in yeah. Groups, you know, because like when you look at a Google, Facebook, you know, like certain actions that people take when using those products, right? They are like searching or even just liking things、mm-hmm. or swiping.、Mm-hmm. Those actions and behaviors become part of the cultural vernacular. So, like, oh, you know, do you swipe left? Do, do you swipe right? Wasn't a behavior that we used to have 15 years ago. Correct. And right. It has a value judgment, ethical component. Oh, like swipe, like swipe left, left, no, you know, or、yeah. you know. So I do think, but you know what it reminds me of? Yeah. You know how people always say, oh, technology is neutral. It's how people use it. I don't. That's not true at all. Technology、mm. is never neutral. It's always like a set of values is designed into it. Like look at AI now. It has、yeah. human biases designed. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So even with like Facebook designed privacy, so there is none. And then Apple came and designed privacy, so they're like, oh, look at us. We care about your privacy. I like all those other tech. You know yeah, what I mean?、Yeah. That's not random. It's design, and that was by design was swipe left, swipe right. So first we design those values, aesthetics, judgments into technology, and then it influences us. Yeah. Back. One thing.、Um... I mean, look at algorithms. They're like they're like sh- sharing with us the most outrageous content. Like they think that we are like. What works best is anger, hate, you know, like strong、yeah. reactions. I know that I mentioned that I, I don't necessarily talk about Apple, but wh- one thing, one of the things that that came to my mind was that, and it, when you were talking about fans, right? Way back when, when Apple introduced the iPod and then、mm-hmm. the the headphones, the product had a very iconic white look, and at the time it was very rare. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I remember this is like back in two thousand three, four, five. Back then, when iPod first came out, and people who bought the iPod had the white headphone, and it kind of became a not so much a status symbol, but like a, a visible community of people、mm-hmm. who were because, like at the time, like Apple was a small player. You know, it wasn't the dominant player that、mm-hmm. it's become since then. No, absolutely, and I would say、yeah. it is a, it is a status symbol, and it was the best advertising Apple could have right, brought right, its、right. branding hope for. Because even like even later when they were when they stopped doing like when they were like AirPods, you、yeah. know how people would walk around the office with that, yeah, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like what? Do you, you know, so it it became like like the first adopters. Dogs. Yeah. I mean, I think now everyone does it, but I think then we were like, wait, you know, like you knew who bought it. People, yeah, right, right, right. First round, yeah.